<laughs> well, it's great to um, have you all here this evening. Thank you, and I, I hope that I'll, you know, look forward to hearing each of your voices and, and meeting all of you. So I'm intrigued to hear where you're all from and, and what your connection to this um, kind of uh, what, what inspired you to come here this evening and, and what you feel in terms of being connected to this as a topic. Um, so yeah, I'm going to tell you the story of how this all came to be and how I ended up doing the pilgrimage. And then um, I, ha I have some questions and some things that I'm interested in exploring and I'd love to talk about with you and, and hear what your insights are. Um, so this whole journey began, I'm a theatre practitioner um, originally and I, my interest in theatre have been around ordinary people and ordinary people's stories and then a deepening connection to nature um, and that's been going through kind of working with ceremony and working with moon cycles and, and kind of witchcraft, that sort of thing. That sort of thing. Um, but, um, but, <laughs> might be if everyone goes on mute uh, just because yeah brilliant thank you um yeah sorry i just got an echo then um so yeah i've been kind of working with um ceremonies where we've been uh meeting hello dawn uh meeting once a month to work with the moon cycles and just yeah slowly connecting with the way that nature works and the cycles and and just really enjoying um <laughs> hello uh enjoying getting to know make nature more and uh, doing herbalism and, and lots of things like this and then when the um, COVID hit, obviously my theatre work completely changed. Um, so I'm going to share these slides with you. Um, so we went into lockdown and I was in a tiny little flat um, that was a, a first floor flat. I had no garden and I was going out on my bike, uh, but obviously wasn't really able to lie down on the grass or spend time in the parks or anything like that and I was really missing the outdoors and um, I then had three friends die uh, in quite unpleasant ways they weren't from Covid it was all from crazy weird situations and I just really needed to get outside um, it was a really strong desire and a friend of mine um, we had had a, an idea of walking a pilgrimage together where um, she was someone who I'd had a massive falling out with um, in, in like 10 years ago. And then we'd become friends again. And we wanted to look at what, what an enemy was. And we wanted to walk the land and talk to people and hear what they thought, um, what you meant by an enemy and who were their enemies and how they'd created their enemies. But like who, you know, is it an active relationship? Are you creating them? Like, or is it just because they've done something to you? Like, what is that relationship? And she was from the north and I was from the south. And we were looking for a route to walk that would um, be a kind of long, substantial walk. And we found this route called the Michael and Mary line, which um, goes along the from the um, sort of land's end in the west all the way to the Norfolk coast. And it's about five, uh, it says 400 miles there, but when you're walking it, it's about 500 miles. And we looked at that as a route and we decided to walk it together and then something happened and she wasn't able to do it. And as I was sat there in this lockdown situation, I just thought, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do it on my own. And that's quite a scary thing to do, but I feel like I need to, I need to get outside and I need to be out, um, out of this flat and go and do it. So I set off, um, I'd been living in Brighton for 20 years. I'd been married for 13 and uh, I'd been working in theatre for 20 years. And very quickly on the route, my life completely changed. And um, I went from uh, like almost within the first week, um, my husband split up with me. <laughs> and so I was suddenly like, OK, I sort of feel homeless now and was just in a completely like, yeah, everything had changed. Like I was I had I had my rucksack and that was all that I had. I didn't have keys to get back into the house. So I didn't know whether I was going to be able to get into the house when I got home. And I just had to kind of trust the universe and trust that I was going to be looked after and that um, everything was going to be OK. So I um, found that basically when people are, when you're being vulnerable, like they could see that I was on my own, people were incredibly kind and looked after me. And not a single day went past where some incredible miracle didn't happen. Like I was just so looked after. Um, and it wasn't just by 
people, but it was by the land as well. And I was walking a, a ley line route, which I'd never heard of before. I didn't know anything about them when I set off. So uh, the Michael and Mary line is this route that is known, the straight line is the Michael ley line. And then these lines that wiggle around it are the Michael and Mary ley line, uh, energy lines. And you can douse them. So I took some dowsing rods with me when I sort of chose this route. And when I was at St. Michael's Mount, I, I held them and I asked them to show me where St. Michael uh, energy line was. And they pointed to the mount. And when I turned around, they carried on pointing to the mount. And so I was like, OK, that was my first experience of dowsing. And at first I used the dowsing rods. But then as I carried on walking, I found that I could feel where the lines were. And I started experimenting with it where I would walk the route. And then at the end of the day, go back and look at the map and see where the lines had run. And I kept finding that I would instinctively walk along the line. And I started to notice that there was a different feeling to the, the different lines. So when I was in villages that the Mary line went through, there was a, a really gentle um, kind of, it really felt like a sort of Instagram glittery filter on everything. It was just really pretty and just this um, very gentle feeling. And then with the Michael energy, it felt really strong. Like I just, it felt brave. I felt like I could do anything and I was um, energized and felt really powerful. And when I reached Glastonbury, uh, which was, you know, I've been walking for a couple of weeks by that point, uh, the Chalice Wells Gardens is somewhere where they cross. So these places where they cross, which are the stars on the map are called node points. And um, when I got to the Chalice Wells Gardens in Glastonbury, that was a, a really strong node point. And I automatically just found myself sitting right on the edge of this bench and um, I closed my eyes and was meditating and I could feel this really strong current of energy, like it felt like a waterfall. And I thought, oh, maybe that's what, you know, what the energy line feels like when it's really strong. And I just sat there with that. And then I went over to the well um, and I knew that the Mary line was at the well. So I expected to kind of feel the same feeling. But when I got to the well, it was the absolute opposite. It was complete stillness. And I realized that the feeling of the, the feminine and the Mary aspect of this line was as if something was like stopping and watching something grow and was just holding space and was this complete safe, very potent space where nothing was happening, but it wasn't interfering, it was just holding. And, and I felt like I had a hand on my heart saying, I've got you. And then with the Michael energy, it was this fast powered energy of like courage and movement and it was a hand on your back saying, you've got this. And that was the, the I suddenly realized I was listening and hearing something from the land that was making me feel these feelings. And um, it meant that I spent the whole walk on my own feeling extremely protected and safe and looked after. And what I also realized when I was talking to people was that the more I listened, the less, uh, well, so as I would listen to people, at first they would always do their kind of, usual political rant you know their soapbox rant um because we were just going through brexit and the um pandemic had just begun so lots of people had a lot to say and i stayed with all different types of people i stayed with wealthy people and poor people i stayed with people who were voting for brexit and were voting to remain um, there were people that were very racist and very um, bigoted, and then there were people who were very open-minded. Um, but everyone I spoke to had quite extreme views that none of them married together. And it made me realize how it's incredible that we manage in any way to have a shared idea of reality when everyone is living in completely different worlds. Uh, like literally everyone was on a different planet. and. It inspired me that we are able to somehow muddle through um, considering that. But also when I didn't react and I didn't argue, it wasn't, I didn't feel like it was my place to try and change anyone's minds. I just carried on listening to what people said. Once they got through their kind of pub rant, the stuff that they're used to saying to people on a daily basis, they then started to open up and everybody was scared. Everybody was in grief. Uh, everybody, uh, was trying their best and I just I, I realized that the archetype of a pilgrim is like a walking confessional and um, people just open up because they're not going to see you again and so yeah people shared their stuff with me and it was a real honor and privilege to hear what people had to say 
And it made me realise how important listening is and that it's something that is a bit of a dying um, art uh, in today's society. And actually, it's quite a, a, a revolutionary act to to say that we're listening and to say that you're listening rather than having something to say. Um, and it felt really powerful. And my friend Anna came and joined me on the walk. And Anna is um, a global policy advisor and is one of the delegates at COP. And she said to me, oh my God, you, we really need to um, do something and go to Glasgow. So we need to walk to Glasgow and we need to do a pilgrimage there. And I was like, okay, let's do it. So I applied to the Arts Council for funding and I got the uh, funding to develop a route and we looked at what, like, I mean, at first I put the, the word out and said, who would like to walk from London to Glasgow? And so that was the original offer. And all these wonderful people um, said that they'd like to come. And it was a really diverse group. Um, it was mainly female, which was pretty cool. And um, there was 28 of us in the end that, that walked. Um, then as I was looking for the route, I then discovered that there was another ley line that ran from the Isle of Wight all the way to the top of Scotland. Um, it set off from the Isle of Wight from a place called Culver Down, which Culver is pigeon um, and dove, uh, and down means hill. So it was, it was Peace Hill and it went all the way to Hope Bay. So we'd be walking from Peace to Hope. And it also had two energy lines that um, spiralled around a central, this central ley line. And they were Ellen and Bellinus, who were Celtic gods. That was just what these people who discovered them and named them as. Um, and Ellen is the goddess of the ways, um, so she's the way maker, and she has antlers like Artemis, and sort of ginger flowing hair. And she she's the the goddess of you know, you know these little paths that animals make, and then humans will follow, and then that makes paths and then roads. And so she's the way maker. And then Bellinus is the Celtic sun god, so it's a bit like Apollo and Artemis, were kind of the the Greek counterparts. And it just felt. And it's called the Spine of Albion, this ley line. And it just felt like that was a really powerful thing to do, to walk this line. So when I looked at the route, um, I was like, okay, we'll, we'll, um, so yeah, just first of all, show you this. This is the, uh, some of the people that walked with us. So this was 500 miles, which was from London to Glasgow. And so we walked from uh, London along the Michael and Mary line again, which was the Ridgeway, until we reached Uffington. Um, and then we started making our way up the Spine of Albion. And the Spine of Albion had a very different feeling to it. I wasn't expecting it to be different. I thought maybe the lines would feel similar. I was interested to see and to experience what, what the difference was. But right from the offset, um, there was uh, three of us that set off from uh, the Isle of Wight and um, began a week earlier, and we started walking through the Isle of Wight and as soon as we got there there was a hang on, I don't know why that image isn't coming up there's a picture there but it isn't coming up um as soon as we set off there was a forest and in the forest there was a sculpture of Artemis and it was because uh, a woman there we go um a woman a young student had been raped and murdered in the forest right on the Ellen line and in her sketchbook, there'd been a drawing of Artemis and someone had taken the drawing and carved it into a tree trunk in the forest in, um, in the Isle of Wight. And it, all the way along the route, we kept meeting women with long red curly hair called Ellen or Ellie or Diana, which is um, the Roman name for Artemis. Um, and they were all either in distress and needed help, like were drunk and passed out and we had to help them, or they were uh, at university doing environmental studies and just like were at the forefront of trying to make a difference in the world. And it, it was just really, it was crazy how many, and, and I met someone called Ellen right at the end of the pilgrimage when I got back to Brighton. And she said that she'd never met another Ellen in her life. And I was like, I've just met at least 12 Ellens. <laughs> in the last month uh, so it was it was quite it was quite unusual apparently to meet that many Ellens um and then the Bellinus um it was the hottest month like we had a really rubbish summer last summer it was wet and cold all summer and then the second we set off it was sunny for the whole of September it was sunny and even when we got up to Scotland in October it still wasn't horrific weather and cop there was only a couple of days of really bad rain but there was you know it was basically dry and sunny for our whole walk um apart from one crazy week where uh 
we were in Shap and that was it ended up being the most exciting part of the walk as well where we got completely drenched and had yellow weather warnings and ended up wading through a river that was all very exciting but it was it was fantastic and there were 28 of us who set off and yeah I picked up the rest of them in London um, a week after setting off from the Isle of Wight and then we all walked up to Edinburgh and then we cut across to Glasgow for the conference and as we walked we held ceremonies so we could we worked out where we thought the chakra points were along the spine and so as well as doing the walk um uh, you know as a, as a, a an act to to go to glasgow it also became about us giving the land a massage and bringing together the local wisdom keepers in the areas where we felt like these chakra points were so in each uh so like the root chakra being the isle of wight um the sacral sh chakra was winchester um then oh no it was uffington and then the solar plexus was um Alderley edge and then we just made our way up the throat chakra was edinburgh which felt really right because that's the edinburgh festival that's where all these stories are told and all these you know all this information is shared through our voices in edinburgh um so in each place, we invited a local wisdom keeper who was someone who knew about the local mythology to come and hold a ceremony for us and then invited all the local people who were into that kind of thing to come along and join us. And it was really wonderful and inspiring. And the one at Uffington um, with the um, chalk dragon or chalk horse on the hill, um, on Dragon Hill, we had like I don't know, 80 people and it was so dramatic. It was it was a really amazing experience but we came away from that and the pilgrims were a mixture of people that had had oh oh And there went uh, Julie in another dimension. Uh, but I'm sure she will uh, come back to a friendly. Listening. Yes. Oh, sorry. There you are. There's a. Oh, did you lose me? Yes, we uh, lost you for like 30 seconds, if you would like oh, to. Oh, okay. Recap. Right, right. Okay. I'll just uh, recap what I was just saying, which was that um, the key factor of what we were doing was to listen to the land um, because of what I said before already that it was important to listen to what people were saying but also to actually listen to to what like first of all to read the landscape to look at the landscape and experience how it was changing you know whether places felt fertile whether they felt well managed um, especially in the Ridgeway when we were walking in the baking hot sun there were fields massive massive fields in Oxfordshire that were you know industrial size fields and they were just cracked and they looked like desert and then we walked through um a, an organic farm uh that was you know being managed completely differently and it was totally green so it was nothing to do with the weather or the land it was just the way that it was being managed was completely different uh, so so listening in that way like being learning to observe and seeing the differences but we were also practicing whether there was other ways a deeper way of listening and that's something that I want to explore more. That's something that I'm interested in talking to you guys about further. It's like how how to listen to the land. We realised in 500 miles and uh, six weeks, I think it was, that we walked for, that, that that wasn't enough time, that that wasn't slow enough. And we, when we got to COP, we met people who um, have been listening to the land their whole lives, indigenous leaders from different parts of the world. And they said even they are now struggling to hear what the land has to say because the language is changing, um, which is something that we thought was an interesting thing um, to consider. Um, so along the route, we started to develop a performance and we had already done workshops in the run up uh, so that we had a shared language. And my discipline is fooling and fooling is a form of improvisation that's very open and loving and um, very creative so it's not like stand-up comedy improv where you're sort of trying to outdo each other it's very much um 
you know, all becoming a dragon together and trying to speak as a dragon or all becoming the land. Um, so you you can speak as anything and can be anything and you don't obey physics or rules. It's just the fool can do anything. Um, so we started to play around with the ceremonies and uh, this is us in the roll right stones where we held a ceremony without anyone else there. It was just us doing it. And it was very playful and that's someone becoming a dragon and us doing a, a mama's play. And we had dancing and singing and all sorts of things. And gradually we realized that that was a really good way for us to perform at COP because we had no idea how many people would be with us. We didn't know what the space was going to be like. We, we had, there were so many different variables that we decided that actually creating this space where we addressed the different elements, the, the, the earth, the air, the wind and fire, and talked about our experience of those elements within the pilgrimage um, and that that then was the performance. So it could be done in a circle in a ceremonial way or it could even be done front on to an audience, which is what we ended up having to do at COP. So we performed at the Green Zone. Uh, it was great that we were able to get in there um, and do that. And it was to a nice big crowd, which was really lovely. And, you know, it felt really important for us to be taking our message up there. One of the most important things as well is that we collected people's voices along the way. So our banner was all of the patches uh, of what people said, what their hopes were for what the delegates might do. So we said, what would you like to say to the delegates in COP and what would you hope to hear on the radio like the week after that has happened? Um, so these are all the different hopes that people have, have written down on patches and shared with us. And yeah, it was quite difficult, um, as we were saying at the beginning, um, COP was quite a difficult experience um just you know there's there's a lot of people there and it was really inspiring to be with all the community of people but it was also really difficult to, to feel that not much was achieved and and that it's even you know already we're having to try and push that that anything that got passed actually is going to happen um and it's a scary time yeah so it's it's a difficult time and i think um all of us are still processing that experience and looking to you know cop in Egypt and how we keep pushing forward and what we do next so the plan next for us is we I mean we thought about walking to Egypt and I'd love to <laughs> it would be an amazing route but we'd have to set off like in a couple of weeks and <laughs> none of us are able to do that um, so what we have decided to do is we're going to walk back along the Michael and Mary, Mary line so it, won't, it will be with the pilgrims I won't be on my own this time and we're going to work on a play called George and the Dragon, um, which is the play of St. George and his many enemies. So again, it's looking at what the idea of an enemy is and how we can learn to work together. Um, because really we're all on the same cruise ship going through space and we need to realize that we're all one rather than be against each other. And that we all need to work out how to change things because we're, we're all gonna hit an iceberg if we don't so it's it's time for us to you know all of the divides and all of the things that separate us we need to we need to put them aside for now and and look at how we can work together but also to know that the land is on our side and that was so strong in the pilgrimage and it's the thing that's so powerful with walking a pilgrimage is you are so looked after and and it is you know a lot of it's just luck and whatever it, you know we could meet the wrong person or we could have an accident but as it happened we didn't and there was this overwhelming sense that you could keep asking for help and that you did get it and whenever we were in difficult situations or like we didn't know what to do we just felt like we were able to ask for help and it's something that um other people are starting to talk about now like braiding sweetgrass uh, which is an amazing book if um, people may have read and she was saying like you know it's a wonderful thing to love the lands and to love the earth but when you realize that the earth loves you back then it's it's a it's a divine relationship and i feel like you know we often in the environmental movement can feel like like there's a carrot and the stick and it can feel very stick heavy that we're beating ourselves up for all the, the bad things that we do which you know is valid um but there's also the carrot which is to deeply passionately fall in love with this land and learn to listen and communicate with it and to know that she's going to be here she's going to be fine it's us that are not going to be okay <laughs> and she actually wants to help like it how can how can 
actually help us? How can we ask for help and how can we let her help us? Um, and that, that relationship, when opened up, uh, is going to help. It is going to help us. Um, so we're going to walk back along this line, uh, doing a mama's play of George and the Dragon, talking about what our enemies are and what the, the story of England's patron saint, this story that's uh, kind of been told for you know, hundreds of thousands of years or thousands of years. And it's it's an indigenous play. And that was one of the things that we also talked about on the pilgrimage is how to re-indigenize ourselves. How can we remember and relearn and create indigenous practices where we bed ourselves back into the land? The landscape as part of it is a, a, a collaborator in the creative process. And uh, we remember these old skills and traditions that um, will connect us even deeper to, you know, how we use materials, where they come from, where they go. So that's the next plan. So yeah, um, any questions? And I'd love to chat to you all more about what you think listening to the land means. Thank you. So has anyone got any initial questions or anything that you'd like to say? I'll just maybe I can start off because brilliant. I just love listening to that. Uh, and actually, maybe my husband even saw you performing because he was at, at the COP whilst I was burning the money for the family. He was saving the world. That was how we sort of contextualized it. But um, uh, th this notion of how can we re-indigenous ourselves, uh, how I can relate to that is also how do we allow our culture to be part of our identity? You know, that this notion of um, that we, we we sometimes in in certainly in the Western neoliberalized world, we've been encouraged to be competitive, to compete with each other, and uh, that is almost the opposite of allowing us to be kind. Now put in the notes this notion that um, I think Humankind was recently published, uh, and the author, Dutch author, is that making making the point that for for decades we've been taught uh, we're the sort of um, Lord of the Flies kind of beast of humankind, you know, that if we only allow us to be free, then we, we are vicious against each other. But he found evidence after evidence after evidence, just like you said, that if you allow us to be, we're actually kind to each other. And of course, the pandemic and the neighborhoods, you know, uh, friendliness has, have actually shown it. But actually, our institutions keep us from that. So, so I think it is about encouraging in the institutions that kindness and building the institution that, of course, is built on trust and these kinds of things. But also this notion that we reconnect with, yes, the land, but also the cultures that, you know, for me, I guess, coming from the arts, culture is a really important thing. And culture is, I guess, hooked up to land and our heritage and our being uh, as a collective species in a place, in, in, in a physical uh, context. Uh, but so I found that absolutely fascinating. Thank you. I, so I, my friend who um, is a politician um, told me recently, which I thought was really interesting, that um, people, when separated and living very individual, you know, little bubble lives, are more likely to vote for the right wing government in the UK, the Conservative Party. They're more likely to vote for the Conservative Party. And the North um, had traditionally voted for the left and uh, Labour. Uh, because they were more community based still they mm. they were they were, had strong communities because they had the mining communities and things like this and as that has now been disbanded and has been separated now they're voting tory again or that for the first time and i think that there's something about how it's easier to control people when you're not a community but community is what mm. There are obviously problems with communities because I grew up in a small town and, you know, I'm now living in this tiny island with just 400 people and everyone knows your business. It's very difficult for you to feel strong enough to be yourself if you don't fit in and if you're different. So there are, you know, there are pluses and minuses to, to both ways of living. But when you lose community, you lose this story, this history, the culture, and a lot of that will be connected to the land. And so it's looking at how we can you know, put, bring that back in culture, which is very much the Arts Council's drive at the moment as well. It's yeah. very much what they're interested in supporting, which is great. Um, it brings it back to the land, but also how to give ourselves permission to create it ourselves as well, to invent our own mama's plays. To So with the um, herbalism training that I've been doing, it's called sensory herbalism. And it's with these women called the Seed Sisters, who I thoroughly recommend. And they... Um, 
they teach you to go and spend time with the plant and then to anthropomorphize them so you draw a character for that plant and you tell a story about that person that, that being and who they are um, and it's easier then to remember the healing attributes of that plant because you have a whole relationship to yeah. them as a named being and doing that was so strong like i i had it from the first pilgrimage because my husband split up with me in the first week i was heartbroken but i was walking along next to hawthorne the whole way and hawthorne is a heart healer and she supports you and, and both times i walked in autumn so the berries were out so i was eating the hawthorne berries and i fully feel how she supported me she supported me because um hawthorne creates boundaries around fields and it lets the little birds and animals through but it doesn't let the humans and the horses and the cows through so it lets what's needed through which is what hawthorne also does in the body so it strengthens the blood capillaries and it lets the right stuff through and the bad stuff not through so it's even doctors even prescribe it as medicine for the heart and I could feel how it helped me create the boundaries that I needed to go home and just change my life. And now I live on this island and I have a completely different life. And, and uh, you know, I feel like it was a gift that that walk gave me. And as I've come back from this second walk, I'm in a, I feel very vulnerable after COP. It feels hard. I'm still very much in a broken place from it. But I've come back and we've had to move house and now I'm living in a really a really lovely place <laughs> like it's just by complete circumstances that I've ended up in this very comfy little nest that's holding me and looking after me and it feels like they've both been gifts of what I needed um which I'm very grateful for and it could just be that it just that's you know just happens but it doesn't feel like it it feels like I've been looked after in both both ways yeah go on Robert can't hear you at the moment Oh, you're muted, Robert. <clears throat> yeah, Bob, you're, mute, you're muted. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. Okay, a couple of points. One is, uh, it's a Central African word, Ubuntu, which roughly translates philosophically as I am because we are. And there was just something else. I want, and that sort of links to things. The other thing was, I've just found this novel. No one is talking about this by Patricia Lockwood. There she is. Mm. Uh, she was uh, born in a trailer in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and raised in all the world's worst cities in the Midwest. Now, the, the review of the thing is, this is a story about a life lived in two halves. It's about what happens when real life collides with the increasing absurdity of a world accessed through a screen. It's about living in a world that contains both an abundance of proof that there is goodness, empathy and justice in the universe and a deluge of evidence to the contrary. So this seems to belie what you're going on about good and evil. And that, it, you know, we're, 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 we're just, you know, it's nature seems to be, or, you know, the, the voice of the land as the good and the voice of, I don't know what to call it, but uh, removal from the land. Uh -huh. and into whatever you want to call it psychedelia drugs i don't know i'm not putting these things down because of that but just ways to describe a sort of alternative reality where you're coming from is what we are we are the earth and then somehow there's some sort of construct i don't know where, where it comes from but it's not to do with the earth it's to do with something else and uh, that's and I, what i, I would think call it's why yeah, I, was just, I think where so much depression and anxiety comes from as well, and uh, you know, it's very fair that young people are depressed and anxious because we're really screwed and <laughs> and they're aware of it. So it's perfectly reasonable that there are so many people struggling at the moment. But at the same time, they're looking at these screens that are just feeding us this negativity and fear and horror. And then outside their window is this beautiful land that's just there that everyone I think um, noticed when they were um, in lockdown that being able to go out and walk in nature helped you know and it and um, as they've been talking more about like uh, wild spaces where you've got really good mycelium where there's a really strong mycelium network and they're wild forests that the forests are communicating with each other with chemicals and that when you breathe them in the body naturally relaxes so we can tell we can tell when we're in a happy, happy forest because it's a safe space, you know, I think in terms of evolution, we were more safe in kind of foresty areas than we were out on the plains or whatever. So as soon as we get into the shade of a, a happy forest, we can feel the chemicals that are being communicated in the air and we calm, our hearts relax. And it's just, yeah, I think the more that we can try, I always think that it's a bit like 
you're looking out over this beautiful view with a waterfall and a rainbow and everything's stunning. And then next to you is this dirty bit of tarpauling. And underneath it is like Boris Johnson and Trump, like arguing with each other. <laughs> sort of lift yeah. it up and it's like, well, you're being tucked way to put under it, there. And way that's to, reality. Oh. <laughs> like, <laughs> another way to put it is, on the one hand, we're living through a portal. And on the other hand, we are the portal. Yeah. It's yeah. there. You know, we are it. And it is amazing what we've done. You know, we've achieved so much. And it's like, I don't feel that there's, um, I'm not negative about what we've achieved because we've. it's been amazing. I feel like this is the moment of opportunity for evolution because there's only so far we can go now in terms of the direction we already are in. Like there's only, you know, space travel's still got some exciting stuff going on with that, that, but that's, you know, that's happening. And we can't really go much further into the atom and get smaller. The things that are really the exciting frontiers in science at the moment are biology and, and working out how like gut fauna, for example, and, and bacteria, which we're realizing more and more. So like the soil bacteria and gut, basically the soil and your gut are the same thing. Our lungs and the trees are the same thing. And as we're learning more about these relationships and, and um, how exciting they can be and what is possible there, the more we're realizing that actually being in the world and being in the present is the amazing place to be right now. Um, but also this, this crisis is the opportunity for us to then evolve into beings that aren't just taking without thinking where it's coming from and throwing it away and not thinking about where it's going. Like we know that that's not okay and we all feel uncomfortable about it. And I think that's part of why we're feeling depressed and anxious. And for us to then evolve into beings that don't do that, so many things go with that, like all working together and seeing ourselves all as one and seeing ourselves as part of the planet and all of these things. It's such an incredible mental shift that we'll have to go through for it to work. That that's an amazing, like we'll be evolved beings if we manage to pull that off. So that is my massive feeling of hope is that, yeah, okay, it might feel really bleak right now, but there is, if we manage that, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, go on, Carola. Yeah, and, and, and that just speaks also to something which I've been uh, thinking about, this balance between individualism and collectivism. So one might say that, you know, we've had a long 20th century where we increasingly uh, prioritized individualism with various marketized versions, with how we assess learning, you know, all sorts of things. All our institutions are geared up towards the individual performance indicators in terms of the individual and forgetting about the collective. Um, but mm -hmm. I think there's now a movement going on. So I can see also in, in culture, I can see, for instance, documentaries, you know, just recently, Adam Curtis's Can't Get You Out of My Head. Um, I don't know if people have seen it. You know, it actually uh, uh, juxtaposes collectivism versus individualism and in saying we've moved too far into the individualism side and we've completely forgot that we can create great things if we work collectively. And then sort of what yeah. you just mentioned is almost on a larger scale, if you include the natural environment into that, and that comes almost naturally when you work together as a collective. Yeah. Yeah, go on, Tamsin. Yes, I was going to say that's what, um, that's what we all felt on our pilgrimage, I think, was that the reason why we, we I think when we set off from the east coast of uh, Scotland, from Dunbar, we didn't, I certainly didn't know that there were lots of other groups all coming together from Norway, from Germany, from from uh, from the Isle of Wight, etc. Until we started meeting people along the way. Um, and there were days when we were walking about 100 strong. Um, there were a core group, but there were people joining us all the time and we were staying with people and so on. And so we had a very strong sense of our individualism, just to, to sort of refer to Carola, in as much as we were all highly conscious of recycling and plastic use and using cars or not. And But to come together as a group, as you say, a very, very disparate group, um, and to realise that there are other individuals around who are also you know, doing the same. And then for the for these pilgrimages to be merging, it was such a powerful thing even before we even got to, to Glasgow. Um, yeah. But from what I've learned, I'm writing about the pilgrimage on Orkney, which is the St Magnus Way, um, and about the difference between an ordinary trail and a pilgrimage. What's the difference in the land? Like, how is it, why is it that people talk about 
um, slightly different angle from yours, but why is it that people say that these things happen on a pilgrimage that don't happen on a coastal path or that don't happen on a, you know, on a, an ordinary long distance? So I'm doing a lot of listening to the land. And as a shiatsu practitioner, as a Chinese medicine, Japanese medicine practitioner, we're always looking at the mirrors. So, and I think this is what, you know, you and Carol are saying as well. So one way of listening to the land is to, is, is to look around us at, at what the mirror of what we're doing is. So you meeting the types of people that you were meeting, the attitude they had to you, the help they offered you, this is a mirror for what the land is telling us. This is a way of, I mean, I'm sure yeah. you know what I'm going on about. Oh, no, and then as you say, yeah. the same within our own bodies. So always referring constantly, how am I in my, in my body when I'm in this place? How am I in my body when I'm in, in this other place with this tree or, or, you know, or not me where there are very few trees, for example. And, and so using the body and using the community and using the mirror of what's happening around us as a way to, to hear what the land is saying. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. That's absolutely wonderful. It's, it's something that um, uh, we've talked, uh, my, my teacher talks about in fooling which was, you know, if you want to know what's going on in your inner world, look at your outer world. You know, it's create, create or be created. You're creating all the time. You're creating your world. And if you're, if people are reflecting stuff back to you, then that's who you are. <laughs> it's like, we're often like trying to work out who we are. And it's like, well, just lift your head up and look, look at the kind of people you attract, look at the kind of life that you're living and, and how people are with you. That's, that's what you're giving out. That's your inner world. Um, yeah. And, and that. that's, that's, that's how it's easy. That's how it's easier for those of us that haven't been brought up to listen to plants or to listen to the land or to listen to or to make dialogue like that. That's how we can start to practice that by getting by, by doing those things, I think. So it's a it's slightly more tangible than than walking along and trying to listen through the soles of your feet, for example, or that lovely photograph of you just sort of listening and being with with the hawthorn thanks so, so much mm, thank you and thank you for doing your walk as well thank you for being part of everything it was it it was like it, until we all came together it was just that was so powerful it felt so wonderful to be part of that many different people having walked it was just such a, a yeah a joy that day where we all came and joined in together it was just amazing and i think um in terms of community the the thing that felt like the lesson we learned um, from the people from walking was the places that feel like they're the most resilient and are going to um, or just are for us to kind of take heed on were the communities that were working together and they were especially in the borderlands so this area yeah where you know above Manchester so from Manchester up to Edinburgh uh, there were lots of communities who I think already feel like they're pretty isolated from London and they're not really, you know, they're not remembered. So they were all kind of used to doing it for themselves, but they were doing some incredible things like buying their own community shops, like buying out their local shop and selling all local produce, um, doing like book clubs where they were sharing books on climate change and, and just different suggestions for ways of, of dealing with things, growing community gardens where they then ate together once a month and had like meals together. There were so many things like that that were happening. And it was like, I feel like this, you know, we can't rely on the governments to to sort it out because <laughs> they're too invested in the game as it is. You know, that they're the people who are invested in it being the way that it is. But we are the ones who are living where the flood is or, or living where the land has only got a few more harvests left in it. Whatever it is, like we're, we're the people who are actually there. And it's those communities working together and I just that feels like the key because it also is something that is tangible, that is possible and we can just get on with it and do it and just start working together in, in, in community. So, yeah, I think it is going to bring it back round to that way of thinking. But it's great that we went on that journey, because like I say, if you were like, you know, gay living in a village 30, 40 years ago, it was difficult, you know. So we've we've allowed people to be themselves and we've allowed a lot more variety to exist through going on this journey of individualism but it's now to then go okay but there were some things that we've left behind that were useful and actually are going to help us moving forward um so yeah it's it's about you know pendulum swinging isn't it and hopefully at some point we find a balance in the middle and maybe then the game ends and <laughs> that was that was the end of that <laughs> who knows <laughs>
Um, does anyone else have anything they'd like to say or add? I'm not seeing the messages. I need to look at the. I'll mention something. Um, can can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Dawn from Canada. Um, I've been on a project for the last couple of years um, uh, called um, How to Draw a Tree. And it's not about drawing at all. It's about how to draw a tree to you. And it's a partner that a project that's partnering with um, people with lived experience of mental illness, and partnering and paralleling the crisis, um, the mental health crisis, along with the climate crisis. And so, in the la in the research part of the project, it's a Canada Council Arts Grant. The research part, um, it's been really amazing because I thought the project would be just myself and a tree. But what's happened is it's been peopled everywhere. And so now there's a tree, a kind of what would be considered a bit of an unusual tree mental health support team. And it's um, an arborist, an indigenous elder who uh, tells a very wonderful story about this disconnection from the land that I um, was gonna mention earlier. But um, uh, a couple other people with lived experience of mental illness, um, an eco-psychologist um, and a neurobiologist uh, who else is on the team? And a, and a priest, a poet, a Jesuit. So he's a Jesuit ecologist. Anyway, so it's been a very interesting project trying to figure out um, how to listen to the land. So I'm really keen um, hearing what everyone is saying about how can this work and how can it be also reciprocal? Because it's very easy to look at how do we take from nature, you know? And how do we continue and how do we, we constantly are taking from nature? It's, it's kind of like a turning, I don't know if you even know this, this book, I think most people are, are, are in the UK, but um, the Shel Silverstein book, you know, on, um, uh, I can't remember what it's called right now, but it's, it's a reversal of um, instead of constantly taking and taking and taking, but how can we actually have a reciprocal relationship with nature and so that this um, process can happen. But it's been very interesting uh, going through this. Um, and now the project is going to be enlarged and to include uh, university students with, with lived experience of mental illness finding a, a tree um, as part of a mental health care team. So it's all exploration stages right now. But a sound walk is happening this, this spring um, that I'm making as kind of the prototype of this process. What works and what doesn't work and, and all, of the, all of the stuff in the way of having us connect with nature. So I appreciate that. And thanks for talking about the Seed Sisters because learning how to listen has been a big, big thing for me with someone that has OCD and a few other whatever diagnoses that I've ignored my entire life, but now decided I'm gonna see what I can learn from this and see how I can potentially grow with this, with connecting with a tree rather than a mental health care professional. So it's been interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think it's, um, so much of it is giving yourself permission that the relationship like so there's a saying kin and kith which um is a it's quite an old english saying people don't really use it that much anymore but um next of kin people have heard of kin kin and kith kith is the land that you grew up on so it's the tree that you climbed and that place that was your imaginative landscape when you were a child and in days of old when people still you know died in the places where they were born they they were shown to their kith, so your coffin would be taken around so that your land could say goodbye to you as well. And that's where you'd have the coffin roots and things and the, um, yeah. And it, that that place is so, it's just, I you know, we had trees that we did talk to. We had trees that we climbed that held us. And I dream about my tree back home quite a lot. Like that, that will come up in my dreams. And it's like, it's this safe space that I, had a relationship with and it was called the Jedi <laughs> and it was my you know he was my friend <laughs> and we just I think all children pretty much all children have some kind of relationship like that with the natural world even if they're in New York like I can't remember there's a writer I can't remember who it was but she was saying as a little girl she grew up in Brooklyn and she would pick the grass that grew up through the pavements and would make little posies that she'd take to her mum and just wherever children are they're fascinated by the natural world and then we're kind of made to believe like we were saying earlier that this false portal tv world is what's really happening and is what's really important and is reality and we just forget and it's interesting because that portal's always been there so it's not time you know this isn't just us now with tv like the romans had a reality 
the Tudors had a reality, the Victorians, like every, you know, in India, there's a different reality. Everyone is living in these different realities. And this is what I was saying when I met all these individuals who are living in different realities. We're all in, we're all parallel universes. Like every single one of us is a parallel universe, having a completely different experience of life. Our sensory bodies feel things differently. We see colors differently. Everything's different. And somehow we managed to form a story together that we're all buying into. And this whole time that we're doing this, there's this natural world out there that's there, that's been there the whole time, that grew us, <laughs> and that's going to continue being there once we're gone. And it's just amazing that we, yeah, we're so, you know, we've been born out of this as well. Like, I do feel like this is all meant to be, you know, in terms of the pilgrimage, we have to keep trusting the process. We had to keep just trusting. And the more you just fall back into the arms of the universe, the more it catches you. That's been my experience. And that's the, the journey of the fool in tarot. So the fool is the highest card in the tarot deck because it's the unknown. It's Zen. It's it's when you relinquish ego and you step off the cliff into the unknown. And we're terrified of that as humans, you know, and it is terrifying. And we're about we're right now on the frontier of an unknown. We don't know what's going to happen. And it's scary. But the more we off that cliff and trust and have open hearts and and yeah it has to come from a place of love i feel like we will you know we will be okay i have to keep telling myself this as well i definitely have the pit of despair that i keep falling back into as well <laughs> it's not like a continuous like yeah we're going to be okay but but the way that i feel that we will be okay is to keep trusting and to keep stepping off that cliff into the unknown and believe that you know believe that it'll be okay and we do create our own reality and therefore, we can create anything we want. So it's possible to do something different to what we're doing right now. And one of the things that I heard, um, it was an indigenous leader from from Canada, and I've forgotten his name. Um, he uh, spoke at a conference that was at a couple of years ago, and he was saying how for a whole shoal of fish to change direction, not all the fish have to decide to change direction. It's just a couple of them at the, at the front, like a tiny percentage at the front do it, and then everybody else follows. And we don't need to make everybody agree with us. We don't need everyone to care about the climate. There just needs to be enough people who care and enough people who start listening and start caring about our relationship to the land for, for the tide to, to change. And it is already happening. That, you know, Although greenwashing and marketing and stuff feels like a negative thing, it also means that it's mainstream. It's high street. It's, it's part of the, the everyday narrative now. And that is our reality and that's our story. So it's already becoming part of our everyday reality. So hopefully it's in time. That's the thing. It just, you know, we are on, on a bit of a like time <laughs> problem. But, um, you know, hopefully that, that enough fish are going to change direction for it to happen. And so we just all have to keep doing that. Keep swimming against the tide. Thank you. Thanks, Dawn. Anyone else? Maybe I can. Uh... Um, add something to that. Yeah. Um, yes, what yeah. I um, uh, the found uh, wonderful was that your work was going from peace to hope, and um, yeah. also in the perspective that um, what Carola said uh, that we are indigenous, uh, but actually we are working towards the future as much as we are working uh, with the the past, uh, in the sense that. You know, we are the future, and um, and that is what seems so um, uh, strong in, in in what you do. That that uh, it is so much connected with the future. Uh, that uh, listening to the other, listening to the land um, as a unity. Uh, the uh, the others are as much the land uh, because we are part of them. Um, we are as much part of the of the past, of our indigenous past, as we are as we are already part of the future. The future already happened by what we. Do today, and the, and that seems also one of the very strong and and, um, um, and one of the, the things that the, give walking such a such a, such a the strength is that this transformative that this changing uh, on a very kind gentle um, way uh, without uh, being invasive without being intrusive, uh, but walking expresses this possibilities uh, of change and. Um, of um, uh, a new future. Um, mm. So that element uh, that it was not only about the indigenous, uh, um, and not only about the land or the arts, but as well uh, that they included already a future um, 
uh, was really striking and uh, I found it very fascinating what you were doing. Thank you. Yeah, there's something about walking as well where you see the stories unfold. You can see why this community and this part of the land is doing things this way and then how that then turns into this and you can see how the landscape has caused that to happen you know the the terrain changes and suddenly you're in this different and it yeah i feel like there's something to celebrate about the past all of the things that we've achieved all that we've created and to and to remember that we've been born out of out of the land to have, we we're all here in the shapes and colors and um, culture and everything has come about because of the climate, the weather, you know, and as all these things are changing, like it's snowing in Greece, like it's such a huge thing, you know, that seems such a massive thing because like we were saying, no one's got any warm clothes and no one's got any central heating. <laughs> it's like it's not part of the culture for them to have snow. <laughs> so it, we, everything is really shifting and changing and I think in, there's real um, like treasuring what we've achieved and what we've done, you know, so it's not beating ourselves up. Like this is where we're at. Uh, one thing I've heard before, which I really love is, is the 21st century. We're 21, we're 21 years old. So we're only just realizing that like, we have to do our own washing up and we have to start cleaning the mess up, you know? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> we've had a good time. We've had a nice childhood. Uh, uh, Mum's looked after us and let us do our thing. And now we are having to start being responsible adults and we need to start taking care of things. But it's okay, that's where a 21 year old is at. So if you think of us like that, then you can be much more compassionate and like, okay, now it's time for us to learn and, and to start appreciating the past and appreciating our heritage. You know, 21 year olds are only just starting to think about their granddads and where they came from and what, what they did and all the things they went through to be here. And for us to celebrate and enjoy all of that, but then to think about the future and therefore, what do we want to do? What do we want to create? We've got all this information and access to knowledge. And so, yeah, what an opportunity to do something. Thank you, Tamsin. It was really lovely to meet you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, what time do we, it's till eight o'clock, isn't it? So is there, or is it till, is that right? Some people have uh, questions or would like to, to... Yeah, I'm happy to keep going. So yeah, just do. If anyone needs to duck out, then that's that's no problem. We'll just keep... Yeah, um, Dawn, I'm not completely optimistic. Like, I, I, it's really good to... Like, um, I actually talked with um, Anna, who is the woman I co-created the pilgrimage with. Um, she... So she's been working in the climate movement for like 20 years and I don't know how she does it because it's killed me. This, this, that journey, that experience in the last year was so um, heartbreaking um, just to really, you know, fully give your 100% focus for five, six weeks to how bad the situation is. It's quite hard to come back from that and just be like, oh, let's just carry on as if that's not happening. Like, you know, it's, it's hard. And I asked her how she copes and what, what, you know, she was saying that her and all of the scientists and people who are at the forefront of, of knowing all about the climate and what's how bad it really is they just they, it's like this you go through moments where you're like we're doomed and i don't know if you've seen the film that's just come out don't look up um you know i feel very much like i'm living the the life of um jennifer lawrence at the moment where it's just like i'm having a lovely time on a little island i've got a new relationship i'm in love and it's all really lovely and i'm just ig ignoring <laughs> the fact that there's, you know, a meteorite hitting Earth very soon. Um, but also, you have you have to have hope because otherwise we just give up. And we are, I, I am, I do believe that we will find a way through this because of things, the, the, the experience of the pilgrimage is that you have to keep trusting the process. And that's the same with making theatre and, and being an artist in general is yeah you struggle and we make mistakes and we have moments where it just doesn't make any sense but if you keep trusting the process then you find a way through and because i do feel like we've been born out of this land we are actually part of nature even though we feel like we've separated from it that this is all meant to be happening and i that's not necessarily a god divine thing but just even in terms of evolution there's a process there's a process that's unfolding and some things get shared and some things develop and whatever it, 
I don't feel like this is the end of our story. And that was one thing that did happen um, when I had like a real listening to the land moment when I was up in Glasgow and I I just I heard that the delegates had left and had gone off in their helicopters and um, not much had happened basically was the news report and I just burst into tears in the shop and I ran out to the sea and I ran out to this jetty and I had to stop myself from swimming into the sea I, I wanted to kill myself I just wanted to swim into the sea and just keep going because I was just like what are we doing like like uh, the world would be better off without us and i hear that a lot i think a lot of people feel that the world would be better off without us and what i then heard and this i don't know where it came from and it wasn't voice or words but it was just this overwhelming feeling of a mother watching her children die knowing that she's dying but the the child that's causing that to happen then killing themselves like no mother that's a rubbish story <laughs> like no mother wants that no mother wants the child that's screwed up to not redeem themselves and to just kill themselves like that what the only positive story that can happen here is that we redeem ourselves and and we, but we won't be able to you can't actually make up for for this but if we spend the next 2000 years trying to and trying to repair the damage and working in a different way and thinking and being in a different way, then that is the better story. Um, and so it stopped me from having that feeling of like, oh, well, the world would be better off without us. It's like, I don't think it would be actually. I think that it's our responsibility to clear up the mess we've made. And that's that kind of, we're 21 now, it's time to put your sleeves up and actually do the cleaning. So yeah, I feel like that's really important. Um, does anyone else have another question? has raised his hand yes is that me um no no it's the other yeah, four ians no no i'm joking yes <laughs> I, I just couldn't hear if you said ian because um i thought someone else had their hand raised either too um hi jolie thank you it's great to listen to your um story of your pilgrimage um i your your name came up a couple of times over the last year with um because my work's about pilgrimage too um i actually um first made a film about traveling down the michael line um in a three in a pedal powered robin reliant um in 2011 um oh, so exactly. yeah 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 right yeah yeah yeah, yeah cool <laughs> okay you know, you know matthew <clears throat> yes I know matthew, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and and I was I was hoping to come and join you walking actually north, but um, I was on my own pilgrimage, which had us, which also weirdly started from the Isle of Wight, but but went to Canterbury, um, and I'm I'm kind of I'm still on that. It's a sort of modular journey, but it I. I I began planning it in 2019, and it was a, it was a kind of it was a, a sort of post-Brexit thing. Um, and I think originally what I was going to set off in April 2020. And my plan, if I, I think what I was, what I was doing with that, with that walk was uh, collecting, I think I said acts of and visions towards a positive future society. Um, and as the pandemic, played out that 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 the sort of a lot of doubt crept into that that vision um and i you know i started thinking questions like well what what even what what does a positive future e even look like now um and um so i'm kind of in the middle of that walk i've done three sessions of it and i've got two more to go i was supposed to be walking this week but I sprained my ankle running last week. Um, so I, I think maybe like my question for you is something to do with your relationship to activism. Because for me, it, like my my relationship to all of the things that you're talking about, to, to becoming more focused to the land, to, to a practice of listening and noticing, and I'm actually the walking that, I, that I've been doing has sort of led me into a deep listening practice and like maybe considering training as a, as a, as a practitioner. Um, so 
but what what that has done has led me away from hope i think and mm -hmm. into into um a place that i could maybe best characterize as a sort of post activism as a kind of a yeah. kind of walking away a walking away from all that from the binary of power and resistance that I've always... Carola just raised her hand, so she been... might have a, something to say just to that. Um, Carola raised her hand, so uh, just to, in a response yeah, to what yeah. you were just saying. Um, so yeah, I mean, but, but yeah, I, I, I'm just interested in, in, your, um, in, in your take on that too, because I, I saw, you know, when you were in, in Glasgow uh, and, uh, um, and, and the pain of, the pain of, of the uh, of that realization that you were just talking about mm. um so yeah i just wonder how you reflect too on on activism now and relationship to pilgrimage carola yeah sorry. thank you yeah, just in response to you because i think you know many of us feel this 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 uh these two things on the one side we're hopeful people probably because we go out either run or do physical things outside in the nature and it gives us a sort of positive spin on, on life and then we feel this absolute depression about what's going on in this world. Now how I reconcile it for myself is actually that you know we can hold both in, in, in our mind and what's actually happening is that the 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 minority of powers that are in power are, are exhibiting the last gasps of what I call this high individualism, you know, which means disaster capitalism, which means um, you know national um, uh, uh, nationalistic kind of policies, you know, keeping the rich in the rich places and these kinds of things. So, but I would say these are the last desperate gasps. And that's why it's so vicious at the moment. And that's why it feels so depressing at the moment, because it's already written on the books that that societies are moving to something else. And that's what I call collectivism. And I can see that and I can see that in arts, I can see that in culture, I can see it in these talks, I can see that on TV, I can see it in the comments on the social media. So people are wanting something else. But the, the, the of course, because we've created this neoliberal mess that we've created, it means that a, a minority is, is ultra powerful, but I can see that as the last gas. Now, as as jo, you know, as um, Jolie actually says, it is the question of how much time do we have before, you know, before the world mm. gives in. But as you said, it's actually humanity which is at stake. It's not the world which is at stake. It's it's humanity, and just because we you know we perceive the world through our eyes that if we cease to exist, then you know, for us the world doesn't exist. But of course, you know, nature will will survive. Uh, you know, I find there's yeah. no no. Yeah. Yeah, well, just with what you're saying, you know, this too shall pass and looking at the seasons and the way that it works, we have winter and then we have summer. And yeah, we're at the moment in winter and spring will come again and summer will come again. And it, it is time dependent as to how many people are going to die and how much war yeah. is going to kick off. Like, you know, and we don't know how far into winter we are yet. It could be that it's just autumn. Um, but yeah, there is definitely the promise that at some point we will come round again and that you know whether we're here to experience it or not <laughs> but, yeah. but you know hopefully we will be. yeah I, I think as think... well um, with what... oh. yeah and I do think substantial change uh, in society uh, tends to come after a, a, a sort of chaos period after a sort of yeah. collapse of something a collapse of a belief of how to do things and stuff like that. And, and I do remember for those, of course, who live in the UK, Brexit was a point where we kind of think, oh gosh, you know, how, how worse can it get? And a friend of mine actually suggested, you know, we need more chaos to really, to, you know, th th this is not chaos enough in order for us to be woken up that we can't continue as, as we are. Um, and, and so I do think, you know, again, coming back to this notion, although that is depressing, at the same time, there's hope in that notion that we, you know, we, you know, as Jolie said, you know, there is actually only up. Uh, we have to create a new society that has a different relationship with each other, that has a different relationship uh, with our land. There is no other solution. Uh, it's a question of how fast we can do it. But you know, if, if humans can't do it, then then nothing can. So we have the abilities, the the, the skills to do that. So that's my hopeful me. But um, 
you know that's just my yeah. personal perspective yeah I, I i you know like we were not going to change when we were in our comfortable everything was fine place you know i mean i remember being in the the noughties the early the 2000s and being at a festival and just watching everyone like prancing around in zebra outfits having a lovely time and just being like this is mental <laughs> like what like you know someone in a sweatshop made that and it's made out of plastic and what what are we doing like just every everyone's having a lovely time and it's great and i am too but something about this is making me feel sick and we knew that it wasn't okay and we've just been kind of going la 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 and having a lovely time so it, it's only through discomfort that we're going to shift you know people need to be forced to change um coming back to what you were saying ian about protesting and uh well, activism uh, I've always struggled with activism. Um, I've always definitely been an activist. Like when I was younger and I did the sort of, you know, questions where you kind of work out where you are on the spectrum. It's like, I'm really far out anarchist. Like I'm, you know, I totally, um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I feel like we can destroy the structures that we have and work things out on much smaller scale levels and in smaller communities. And I've always been, you know, living in squats in Berlin and all of this stuff and going to protest. But I also felt like no one's listening to the people that look like activists who are shouting outside the buildings that actually are the ones that need to listen, who, who make the difference, who make the changes. And so it's important that they exist. And if that if that drive is in you, and that is important to you, then brilliant. And I'm glad that that person's there because we need them to be there. We need the pressure to be on. We need to have the right to be able to protest and we need people protesting. If it doesn't quite work for you and it doesn't quite sit with you, there are many other ways, as you know, to protest and to, to do activism without it being out there with the placards shouting in the protest. And that was the big thing with the difference with listening. Um, was Yasmin, I could, I've forgotten maybe her name, uh, but the, the other day you did the pilgrimage um, from Scotland, the, uh, it would be interesting to have heard what her experience was. But I know that some of the um, Extinction Rebellion uh, pilgrimage experiences had some negativity. They had like police called on them and there was a bit of hostility because they have a reputation now, you know, because they've had the media do a job on them and they're now seen in a particular way. And because the motorway, the, the M25 shutdown thing, just as everyone starts going towards COP, so, I, and I, you know, that probably was undercover police. I always am really sus suspect of groups doing extreme sort of crazy things that get loads of press, like just before COP. I question whether that was instigated by undercover police because that's that's the way that I've seen a lot of things happen over the years. Um, but they've already got a reputation. And so the thing that was different about us and we were treated completely differently was because we were listening and we didn't have an agenda. Uh, we had the conversations and we had conversations with army people, with builders, with so many people that wouldn't, I don't think, have interacted with Extinction Rebellion. But it's because we didn't have that label and we didn't have, and we were really different as well at the um, meeting of all of the different pilgrimage groups. Everyone had banners and we didn't have a banner. We didn't even have the, um, the uh, patches banner with us. We were... Um, uh, very visually a group um, because we've been doing this fooling together and all of this improvisation work. We moved together, we were shoaling and we were moving like a shoal of fish and we were dancing and we just, we had a very different atmosphere and we didn't have the big flags and things. And yeah, it just felt like um, when we walked through villages, people saw us and they wouldn't necessarily know who we were or what we were doing. But what we did do is we disrupt the, we disrupted the status quo because we looked weird. I mean, I was walking along with a sheep skull on a stick with feathers and I had feathers coming out of my head and I, we just didn't look normal. And we saw like, you know, mothers like chatting over their fences, like uh, just stop and look at us and watch us pass. And they had to make up their own stories as to what we were and what we were doing. And I felt like that was as, as important as us having our political message and stopping and talking to them, which we did as often as we could. But at the same time, there was something really magical about the people going past us in their cars, just going, what? <laughs> I have no idea what's going on there. That's that's not reality, because even doing that just made people question, like there's something else going on. There are other people living lives in a very different way. So this isn't the only way. And so even in that, it, and then also with something um, 
especially living on this island, there were a lot of people with very um, bigoted, very old fashioned views because there's, you know, there's not as much diversity here and there's people that um, are not being challenged by anything. And when I hear someone saying something that I think is really wrong, like it will normally be called out by someone else. Um, but I'm a barmaid. I work on I work in the bar and something that I've, I do regularly is I will have conversations with other people in front of that person talking about whatever it was that they said, like talking about racism or whatever. Um, and and this is what I think theatre is and what I think art is in general is that you create this performance that is putting forward an idea and the person can sit and relax in their own space and digest it and hear it and make their own mind up. Whereas when you directly attack someone and go straight at them, most people will put up their defences. They're not going to listen. They're not going to change their minds. But if you emotionally connect with them by a performance or a story or having a conversation in front of them and then hearing a different perspective, a different way of thinking, because that's actually um, how I know Matthew. We did a performance um, backstage in Biscuitland with Jess Tom, with, um, who has Tourette syndrome. And we took our play all around the country um, performing uh, what it was like to live with disability and have Tourette's syndrome. And um, it, it meant that people just, uh, like we had councils watching the performance who then redesigned the way the council buildings are designed because they realized that, yeah, if you're someone with Tourette's or using a wheelchair, doesn't mean that you're always gonna just be a front of house person. You might also wanna access the stage because Jess couldn't get onto the stage half the time. And so it's like, yeah, you need to redesign your theatres. You need to redesign, like, why could someone in a wheelchair not be a judge, for example? Like, how wheelchair accessible is the judge's raised platform in, in the law courts? Or what about being a lighting uh, person in a theatre? How, how can someone who's in a wheelchair get into the lighting box? So it, it changed the way that councils design their buildings. And that actually had a massive impact across the country with theatres wanting the play because it was the popular play to get books and have in, but then being challenged by the fact that like Jess couldn't get onto the stage or couldn't get through the dressing room doors or whatever, because it was just assumed that people using wheelchairs will just be coming to watch the play, not actually being in it. So it's, it's our reality, our design and everything. You know, I struggle with chairs because they're designed by men. And so my feet never touch the floor properly on chairs because I've got short legs. It's just like everything's designed a certain way with a certain status quo. And it just doesn't work for everybody. And it, it's not like anyone's done anything wrong. We've all just been doing it from our perspective. But it's about opening those up and challenging them wherever you can. So activism doesn't always have to be hard hitting. Um, that needs to exist. And it's good that it does. But if that's not working for you or not doing it for you, then there are other ways of doing it that kind of can be gentler and maybe more accessible. Yeah. Cool. We probably need to start coming to an end, I guess. No, <laughs> not necessarily. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, you just no, let me know when I need to stop. No, I wanted to add to, to what, yes, what uh, Ian and Carola said. Actually, Ian, you used a very interesting term, uh, post-activism. I'm, I'm a post-activist. And Carola is talking about um, academic activism, uh, which um, I think these are, we are indeed going to other forms of activism as we have known before. Uh, that I'm thinking about, for example, I forgot uh, his name, but there was an, an activist in Turkey who was standing in silence in, in, on the main square. Um, he was at the same time an artist and not doing anything, not protesting, not in the, in the, uh, at least in the technical sense, but just standing there in silence, which had an immense effect um, also on a political level. Uh, that. Uh, um, I think about what, what uh, Annemarie de Kiesemaker, the choreographer, did in Brussels after the terrorist attacks, where with her dances she invited um, uh, the population of Brussels in four groups from four, um, the four wind directions to, uh, to go to the main square um, as slow as possible in silence, referring to oriental practices um, of, um, uh, of slow walking and uh, at one side, to as a reaction on these horrible uh, events, uh, not to shout, but, but, but to be a sort of serene and show an, um, an, in, uh, an inflection inside. And but at the same time, uh, when these groups arrived at the Central Market Square in, uh, in Brussels, uh, they didn't keep in silence, they started a party. They started to dance and to enjoy themselves and to 
put as much as, as joy possible um, in um, give as much as possible joy back to the city that was in real in shock at that moment because of the terror attacks with so many people that died there um, which could, which is also an, an alternative form of activism uh, like activism to joy which is much in the line of what you are doing and um, um, and I'm really interested in, in what Carola understands under academic activism, which is an, um, uh, seems to be also very, um, it's not to be an invasive, manipulative form of activism, but more like um, a poetic or, or let's say based on, 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 on uh, um, how words can change the world uh, without, uh, uh, yeah. Um, so, um, uh, that is, uh, as I talk too much, I mean, uh, I'm really interested in how you see all, all that are here, uh, forms of post-activism. And, um, and if, if it is indeed something like post-activism um, is uh, happening now. Um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think like walking, it, that's, that's, my, that's my chosen act of post-activism, you know. Walking is a is a revolutionary activity. Um, yeah, so I, 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 you know, for me, the, the term the term actually comes from a um, I picked it up from a um, Nigerian thinker called Bayoa Komalafe, um, who is amazing. Who's just like an incredible thinker, um, and he. I think you know he he uses it when when I first came to his work it it just struck such a chord with me because he he was he's he's talking to voices of the of the burnt out of the you know of those of us who have reached the end of a possible road of, of, of kind of activism or you know what whatever being an artist or, or, or don't know you know don't know where to turn and, and and it just that I was I was there when I came across his work um, I, I felt like I'd gone as far as I could go as a filmmaker I felt like I'd gone as far as I could go as an activist and I felt like I'd gone as far as I could go as an artist um, and and that that the idea of the idea of stepping out of 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 all of those pairs of shoes somehow and 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 into something else, um, which he talks about post activism. He talk he also talks about um, becoming fugitive and and you know becoming lost, choosing to become lost, and and doing that collectively. Um, you know, like uh, choosing to, to walk away, um, for me, it, it is is also, you know, while 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 I might frame it within this idea of post activism, it's it's also a really powerful act of activism. Um, you know, the, the, I, I feel like the more of us just walk away and walk away together without really knowing where we're going. Um, the less power remains at the centre. Um, so yeah, I, I don't I don't want to ramble too much and take up loads of time, but yeah, like maybe I would suggest um, looking up Bio Akomalafe. I'll I'll put his name in the in the chat. Yeah, put him in the chat. I absolutely love what you just said. We walk away, and we walk away together. Um, I've always felt like the best activism I've ever scene is the scene in uh, the life of brian where they all just start laughing at julius caesar i was just <laughs> it's just like just that act of laughing at julius caesar we all just start laughing at the government <laughs> just like whatever <laughs> sort of it's just not it's nonsense and the more of us that do that the better because it is a bunch of people who've made up a game that suits them that all the rules are, are in place to support them continuing to thrive at this thing they've made up we just the more we can go right okay whatever like it doesn't serve me so i'm going to go over here and do something else and you can play your little game the problem is is they've got the guns and that's the reason why the game was able to exist in the first place you know at some point someone forced some people off the land and that i think is there's a really big i don't know if you've read the book of trespass um but that's a fantastic book by nick hayes um 
and that's yeah he just starts walking through landed gentry's land and, and most of them don't have barbed wire fences because they're so entrenched we're so used to them being there that they've just got small little red brick walls and we just don't question it it's like yeah that's the earl of whatever's estate this is the lord of whatever's land and you just don't go through it and he's just like no i'm walking through it and so he started climbing over these fences and just walking across the land and just observing how they're being managed because they're making money you know these estates are making the money they're logging or whatever it is that they're doing they're, they're making money off of this land but it's these you know so these people at some point in the history often through slavery like you know there's, it's never going to have been pretty somehow managed to force people off this land decide it was theirs and then they're the ones who've been looking after it and they haven't done a very good job <laughs> and so here we are now at this point in time where that needs to be questioned and that was one of the things that was really hard at, at, at glasgow and as part of the process I'm in at the moment and the struggle that I'm in at the moment is that we really came up against that in a very like uh, I've never been so in my face uh, experience with it it wasn't the people that we walked through the communities that we walked through who uh, were negative towards us the place where we experienced the most negativity was the other activists when we got to Glasgow who were the upper middle class lovely lovely people doing you know doing their thing but there was just this, um, we were staying at a castle, we were staying at the Earl of Glasgow's um, castle, no, the Earl of, yeah, the Earl of Glasgow, the Earl of Glasgow's castle, Kelburn Castle. And they are this left-wing um, activist family who care about the environment. But it was a castle uh, who, it had been taken off of the Celts, so that land had been taken off of earth-worshipping people and had been Christ Christianised, so the, the, this family had then Christianised the, um, thank you, Jeremy. Um, uh, Christianized the area, put, built all these churches, and the same family had been there ever since. So since the 11, 1100s, they've been there. And they, the eldest son had inherited the castle. It was just him there. He was struggling to manage it. His sister hadn't got anything, so he'd got the whole lot. His sister hadn't got anything, and then they were struggling to manage it. And then they're there saying that they care about the land, and it's like, well. <laughs> share your land with some people <laughs> like share the land don't manage it like this like you've everything about the situation was crazy we were there with all these indigenous people from all around the world and we were all being put up in this castle and the castle was full of like trophies and relics and prizes from all of the colonial activities that this family had done over like, the last thousand years and all these people are staying there and it's like yeah this is weird and all of us pilgrims who were from a much more lower class background just automatically were treated and sort of fell into the role of serving so we were serving people because we could see that people were hungry because they'd been at meetings all day and hadn't been fed and then the people who were like organizing the whole thing were like swanning around holding flutes of champagne and kind of con congratulating themselves on what they were doing, which, yeah, great. It was great that they were doing what they were doing. And it, it led to the Earl of Glasgow going to the House of Lords and doing a speech at the House of Lords about climate change. He talked to the indigenous people and had heard firsthand what was going on. And he said to the House of Lords, we need to do something. There was only a handful of lords there and they were all mainly asleep, but that happened and that was fantastic. It happened and that was more of a result from the pilgrimage than we could have ever hoped for. We didn't ever expect that that was going to happen. But at the same time, we realised how there are conversations that we can and need to have that are awkward conversations with these people that we are actually connected to. So like, you know, I don't have the Earl of Glasgow's phone number, but I do have someone's phone number who was the person who got us into that castle. And both the Earl and that person both were acting in a privileged way and were not seeing their privilege and were not, they just didn't get it. They didn't get how inappropriate all of this behavior was. <laughs> and we and we were there sort of in shock about stuff that's happening. And we tried to confront them at one point and there was a comedy moment where the door was locked and he couldn't get through the door and he was trying to like escape from us. <laughs> we were like, hang on a minute, why are we suddenly being treated like servants? It just we all sort of just naturally fell into these roles of behavior and i think in the uk especially there's a real fetish for upper classes like we watch downton abbey and we just love the idea of it and the queen and you know we love this story we love this whole like uh, idea of the rich but actually that is the thing that needs to be questioned that's the elephant in the room with with climate change is like all of the best intentions in the world doesn't change the fact that a bunch of people own the lands because they decided they do 
everything is in place to keep that structure as existing and they haven't done a good job and so somehow at some point someone needs to we somehow need to collectively say wait <laughs> what are you doing you can't you can't carry on doing this it's not your land it's our land it's everybody's land and you're not doing a good job um but that yeah it's how we have those conversations what was that jeremy yeah what do you want to say anything i didn't see what your message just said and get the chat back up yeah yeah it's i'm i'm also you know i grew up in essex and um i'm intimidated as well it's like how do i have these conversations with people that had public school upbringings and went to debating societies you know that's the other thing it's like how can we uh, support ourselves and as collectively to feel confident about addressing these issues and speaking out because yeah i mean we're, we literally have been groomed to feel intimidated by the whole situation so that's also another thing that I, that's my next kind of project in myself and as an artist or whatever is how to approach these conversations uh, in a way that means that they listen as well because of everything i was just saying if you come straight at someone and attack them they're not going to listen so how do we have these conversations in a way that um mm makes people open up yeah and in this discussion of course land and uh private assets are, are a key issue there also you know i come from the arts field so we've been discussing over the last decades what is the common what is the common cause in arts and culture you know why do we not have access to schools anymore to have the means of production cultural production ourselves because of course when you go back and understand what the commons was it was a shared land where farmers had the means of production because they had access to the land and that was taken away and the means of production was taken away and of course as you know and I'm, I'm, I'm not you know i'm not an expert in terms of marxist theory but this this notion of with the taking away of a means of production you you become in servitude because yet then you have to lease or buy into the access which makes you servitude to those who own the land and when that land is being you know, um, owned by an elite or by a minority that has the power over the means of production, you know, you, you, you can't sustain yourselves. Now, in the cultural field, we have these discussions again and again. How can we have again, you know, it doesn't, it, it, there doesn't need to be this hard private and public, but there is this common good in between. And again, you know, we see movements like the cooperative movements, which created that space, even in a sort of neoliberal economy they created this commonly shared space so it's not private it's not public it's something in between in which the means production for, for production whether that's a cultural producer whether that's uh, you know a coffee house whether that's a school loads of corporates are of course schools uh, have created their their space in which that happens so again you know on the positive side i can see that there are so many positive germs uh, emerging that the, the the movement is shifting and then actually, and you know, I guess this this is a question to Babak because I think that the global south is actually much more progressive in these movements from what I hear, but I don't have my own experience. Possibly because there's already the understanding that the global north's models just don't work, uh, certainly not in a fair way. Um, but you know, again, coming back to this notion that there are these desperate attempts to keep it to a status quo. So the question of land ownership, asset ownership, building ownership, you know, the, the what keeps specifically, you know, Britain uh, 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 into this class system, uh, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to shift, but, you know, it's, it's being attacked, you know, it's, I think there is a sort of cultural shift happening. Well, because my, yeah. I was called out, I have a quick uh, response yeah. to that. Uh, I think you're right in that there is more activism uh, in this respect in uh, the global south in general, but also um, there is uh, uh, much more of a poverty gap in <clears throat> almost every single country in the global south. Uh, so there is much more urgency with uh, these people who are activists in having to fight for their own survival um uh, to to uh, uh, through activism 
to actually survive. Uh, I mean, uh, in, here in Brazil, uh, there often you'll see on the news, also in the West, uh, um, uh, activities, activism that is instigated by the uh, indigenous communities from the Amazon or from, from uh, other places in Brazil. Uh, but these people suffer um, injustices that in the UK or in the Netherlands or you know in Europe you you cannot imagine, right? Uh, and even nowadays in the United States you also can't imagine this anymore because in the United States the indigenous communities were murdered, well from 400 to 100 years ago or so. So all the terror um, that you know, not all the terror but some of this terror that peoples hear are suffering through through illegal logging of the Amazon and whatnot uh, already happened in the United States up to uh, so somewhat like 100 years ago. Um, so it's it's so abysmal that the only thing you can do is almost uh, be an activist for your own survival. Uh, but there is much more of it, absolutely true. Uh, um, there is also um, uh, maybe because of the larger poverty gap, uh, but this is speculation, um, and uh, really, the, the, the much, I mean, this is not taking away from uh, uh, challenges that people have in the global north, but there is much more suffering and there is much more, you know, similar suffering. So it pays to band together to try and fight uh, those that uh, abuse you um, because you have very little recourse. You know, the, Brazil is thankfully not the worst, but I also lived <clears throat> in Africa for seven years. Uh, and there's you know, the vast majority of countries in sub-Saharan Africa particularly, but offer almost no legal recourse if capitalism or politicians abuse you. you know, what can you do? You can't go to the courts. You can go to the courts, but it's pointless. Right? So what, what can you do? Well, you can go onto the streets, maybe, but there's little else that you can do. Right? So. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I do think... Again, you know, because when, when we heard what happened at the COP, certainly from the coverage that, that I was involved in, and of course I live probably also in my bubble, but I heard a lot of um, discourses in relation to the tensions between the Global North and Global South, you know, and that, that, that has come to the fore again. And I do think coming back to the academic activism, what we're seeing is um, when we talk about post uh, activism or um, what's happening with um, clean activism, what's happening with uh, Extinction Rebellion, what's happening with academic activism, that we've realized that we've encultured an unfair system in our institutions, in our economic, economic systems, in our everyday life. And that again, <laughs> there are loads of voices pushing against that. Um, so, uh, it, I think it's not a surprise, and it's probably also uh, a sign of a healthy discourse and a shift in how we think the future should look like, and that should actually ideally then shape the future, because of course, you know, we collectively will be the ones who shape the future. Um, well, if not us, who? Yeah. Um, but whether we will, I'm not so convinced. Uh, this goes back a little bit to what uh, I think Jolie was saying earlier about the show of fish, where only a few fish have to decide to make the whole, uh, uh, to make society uh, change. Um, this is of course true, but it's not any combination of fish. In the case of the show of fish, it has to be the fish in the front. And in <clears throat> our case, that tends to have to be people at the top, that is, you know, the po politicians. Uh, the the what's the right the, the captains of industry how horrible a term that is but if um, the likes of uh, uh, I don't know Elon Musk Warren Buffett uh, Bill Gates and uh, Peter Thiel uh, are going to keep on um, uh, abusing capitalism to their own advantage and create a framework that allows others through cryptocurrency through a blockchain through NFTs. To do the same, uh, you need a lot more people to ha to make the show of fish change direction because lots of the show, lots of the fish in the show will not want to change direction in the direction that is actually good for the majority of the fish because they have a vested interest where they stand to lose. So, mm. yeah. And then there's also, then there's also China and China. Russia. 
you know so there's a there's a huge there's a huge other thing going on which is that we're we're having these conversations but in in all of these conversations china and russia are a huge superpower that are on the up you know and actually there's whatever they decide is going to be a huge influence on what happens in the future as well well that's true but also there is a certain uh, uh, fairness uh, that they uh, are proponents of uh, that is the west or the global north has gotten rich over the heads of these very countries uh, they have uh, there, there's this video that is worth uh, searching out of this indian intellectual and he's at some conference and he talks about uh, how uh, at cop 26 i think everyone is expected to take steps back um uh in um, uh, the production of carbon um uh, gases and he goes off on an extreme rant on how extremely unfair it is that the West, who got rich over the backs of his people, now expect his people to take steps back in order to serve the needs of the rich. Yeah? Countries mm -hmm. like India or, um, uh, well, Russia is a fairly developed country, but no country in Africa, very few countries in Asia, except for maybe Russia and maybe China. China is producing a lot, but has a billion and few people, um, actually produces per capita comparable amounts to anyone in the West, let alone the United States, right? So to then demand from these countries that they need to scale back is is like an insult. It's it's really it doesn't you know it doesn't touch anything um and the, the countries that need to really take the lead on this the united states the united kingdom the most countries almost all countries in europe they want everyone else to come with them no if they really want to make a difference they have they have to be that show of fish yeah yeah absolutely right so yeah. so yeah we if not us then who changes uh, the world but uh uh, even if we try, uh, uh, well, there still has to, there's a lot that still needs to change for us to be able to be those people that change the world. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's true. But then, uh, I mean, with this, <laughs> with this experience of the Earl of Glasgow, I mean, he's he's an old power. You know, he's not he's not Elon Musk. He's you know he's an old power. But him actually being exposed to and talking to indigenous people, hearing their stories firsthand about their experiences of having no water and, and the, the jungle going from where they live and all of the different stories that he heard got him to go and talk to the House of Lords. So I feel like the, the conversations are, you know, it's just, it, it's how we keep exposing people as much as possible to to other people and that's the same on this little island you know we don't people aren't expect it was um i think it's in braiding sweetgrass where she says how can you you love what you know yeah you you protect what you love and you love what you know and this is the thing with people walking as well like the more we can get people to actually walk and be in nature the more that we get people to actually experience nature the more they will love it and the more that they will then protect it and yeah it's because i mean one of the things that you hear about is people uh you know like Elon Musk thinking about how to invent trees that will then suck out the <laughs> it's like you don't need to invent trees no, there's <laughs> trees. trees exactly exactly yeah <laughs> and yeah. it is like yeah. technical yeah <clears throat> technology uh, solutions instead of natural solutions yeah like and while to... developing technology solutions sucking the air out of the rest of yeah. <laughs> as here on earth it's it's just absolutely yeah. crazy you know i just absolutely crazy but you know hey <laughs> yeah you, you yeah, but there's all, there... sorry. sorry go on no, no, go on. <laughs> because i said you gotta laugh but you know i i, I got reminded that jody said that we, we might be able to act a sort of activism by making fun of politicians. I have a feeling, you know, and of course I'm German and, and people will know that Germans do not have humor. Of course they don't have humor. And of course I'm married to an Englishman and I never understand his humor. And, um, but I have a feeling from a German perspective that the UK is in such a chaos because through the act of humor, we endure so much more. <laughs> So, you know, maybe we have, would have had an uprising already, you know, gosh, three or four years ago, if it weren't for all of those brilliant comedians, 
making such mm. fabulously fun of um, uh, of of our political elite. But you know, who knows? <laughs> That's actually also uh, that I heard somebody once say about Zimbabwe. Uh, oh, really? So maybe you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's uh, about the comedians that uh, uh, are really, in the end, the best friends of uh, the dictator of the country. Yeah, because kind of it relieves tension. You can laugh about it, but then, you know, maybe it relieves the the, the vicious anger that you need to actually do the last steps to, to change something. You know, I don't yeah. know. But, um, it's, well, what you're saying is really a different uh, uh, variant of uh, give them bread and games. Right. So yes. if you keep the populace happy, uh, then they will not uh, see the injustices that are being done to them. Um, uh, let me say one more thing about uh, it takes only a few fish in the shoal to uh, to change the <clears throat> shoal as a whole. There's not a problem with, uh, well, what, late stage uh, capitalism um, is that uh, particularly, again, in the West or in the global north, um, everyone has a huge vested interest in maintaining the system as it is if uh, because if we all would start producing and consuming what is sustainable uh, many countries in the global south or many people in countries in the global south would actually go ahead or you know be uh, be able to produce and consume more but no one in the global north will be able to produce and consume more in fact they will have to take huge steps back right <clears throat> and that's difficult to accept no one wants this. I mean, we can, in this very small group, uh, uh, rationally justify maybe this to ourselves, that we have to accept these uh, you know, harsh times for, for us as society or humanity to survive. <coughs> but sorry, <coughs> but um, the vast majority of people will not. And, you know, that's and probably also most of us are reasonably comfortable. You know, we can probably take lots of steps back. Not everyone, maybe, but, you know, on average. But if you are a part of um, the lower classes in the United States, my God, man, you're still consuming and producing so much more than someone in Kenya. But you, you can't consume less because you're almost dying already. Right. Yeah. Because the, the food is terrible. Healthcare doesn't exist. Uh, uh, accommodation is shit. The politics are terrible. This, so what, what can you leave behind from a situation like that to save the world? Nothing. <laughs> so, mm. you know, it's these these fish uh, are going to be very hard to uh, to convince. <laughs> yeah. So that's not to yeah. say, of course, that it's doomed to fail, but I'm um, just saying that it's difficult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it was another experience that we had on the pilgrimage of um, people's connection to nature was very much dependent on on wealth. So the we walked up through um, really affluent, like south of England, the Cotswolds, absolutely beautiful. Everyone living in these gorgeous cottages with roses growing around the doors and everything's absolutely beautiful. And they all are going out with their dogs for walks and they've got their Wellington boots and they love getting muddy and it's you know a beautiful <laughs> place to live. And then you go through Stoke-on-Trent and it's absolutely like, you know, even the, the weather spoons, which are the, the chain pubs, was just a complete mess. Like it was, you know, the, the food was um, mainly fried chicken and, you know, McDonald's. People aren't eating healthy food, so they have no connection to, you know, organic mm. food and green produce. And and the, the space that people were fighting for there was an old mining landscape. So it was brown brownfield site. Um, and the uh, local industrial park wanted to grow and wanted to expand and, and build on this site and they were fighting to try and keep it because it was the only space that they had that was green and there were newts and there were bats and they were trying to keep this space and it's like that was such a different experience to you know people like we were in Winchester and the, the college there who was you know for the the prime ministers of the country like Winchester College is like one of the top colleges and they'd like they didn't like the bypass, so they got rid of it and and had meadows built there instead. Like they just got rid of the bypass and had meadows, and it had the cleanest river in the whole of the UK running through it. It's like yeah, you get to have nice nature if you're wealthy, 
and you like walking and you like being muddy. If you're poor, you scrub your doorstep and you keep it clean and you don't want to get dirty and you're not interested in going out into the countryside. It's just not part yeah. of your reality. So to get yeah. people to care about nature when they're from that background is really difficult. It's so difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, although as um, a counter example uh, to this uh, is a change in urban infrastructure, particularly in the Netherlands over the last 30 years, where lots of uh, um, 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 transport infrastructure roads that uh, used that were built for cars only uh, have in cities in the last 30 years been redesigned to facilitate primarily bikes and uh, pedestrians um, oh. you know, changing four lanes to one uh, for cars and adding green space and bicycle lanes and uh, uh, space for um, uh, pedestrians and adding lots of green uh, and you know what's What's I think funny is that the, the Dutch, I'm, I grew up in the Netherlands, right? I've got a Dutch passport, so I'm Dutch, but I'm from Iran, so I'm not really Dutch. But, um, and I've been out of the Netherlands, so I, you know, I go back once every two years, so I see these changes, and I'm like, oh my God, that's beautiful. But because this change is so slow, and it's been happening over the last 30 years, the Dutch believe that this is something inherent to the Dutch, right? That the Dutch are a cycle nation, they are, but, but that also the cities have, the, have been always designed to facilitate uh, bikes primarily, but that's absolutely not true. That's really something from the last 30 years. I mean, the Dutch are a cycle nation, meaning that they cycle everywhere, but you know, cars had prefer precedence, preference uh, on most roads until uh, 30 years ago or so, uh, or 40 maybe. And, and that really has shifted over the last few decades and everyone loves it, right? You know, car owners complain at first and then it changes and then they see that their kids can play everywhere and they're like, oh my God, this is, and then they think that this was what they always wanted. So there, the, the fish that led the show were the mostly local politicians facilitated by national politicians to move everyone in a different direction. And although some were demurring, everyone in the end uh, loves it. So, you know, this, it is possible. And I do remember that. I do remember a talk that, you know, gosh, <coughs> ages and ages ago where they said, you know, there was a 10 year policy where every municipality had to put in cycle ways to every school. And and that was just they had to do it. Every local authority had to do it yep. in 10 years. And uh, uh, and now everyone thinks, yeah, as you said, Netherlands uh, has such an encultured historic uh, uh, relationship to the two cycles, but it was uh, more sort of sort of policy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was policy to facilitate cycling so much. I mean, they've always cycled, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, to facilitate cycling so much. And now you, what you've seen, I mean, <clears throat> if you go to Paris now or many German cities as well, Austria, Northern Italy, even uh, many uh, urban centers um, are being redesigned around cycling and walking. London as well is also seeing changes. Uh, in places, but you know, it's not an easy change uh, because yeah. people in cars, uh, they but, have the money and uh, they uh, yeah. are vocal. And I think there are opportunities just because mentioned Stoke and Trent, and of course, you know, that's exactly where my host institution actually lives. So we actually mm. had a, a transnational project with University of Sao Paulo, actually, and oh. uh, uh, Institute of, uh, in, in also one in Finland, us, Sao Paulo and one more country, I don't remember one, all about brownfields, reusing brownfields mm. because in sort of post in, in inner city biodiversity again and seeing these spaces for the communities would allow people uh, a, a better access to outside play areas and of course there's all sorts of issues about safeguarding them, you know, they, sometimes they are uh, chemically, um, you know, uh, uh, damaged, uh, but many of them come still from the 18th century, where it's just, you know, bricks which are all over the place, um, specifically in Stoke yeah. and Trent. And so, um, it's, uh, we, we didn't get the funding then, but we're still going to do that. And it's again, you know, a sort of activism where you find a new solution and that might just shift how we perceive this thing like brownfield spaces as, as spaces where community yeah. can have some ownership again. Well, they was they were so proud of that space, and they put they just collectively bought it, you know. So they uh, they they yeah they collectively bought that space and managed to save it. Um, and it it was so it was such an asset, you know. It was a really valued asset. Uh, it just it was just so interesting to see the different you know accesses and privilege that people yeah. have to, to being able to access land and how that was so 
special and yeah like you said it was covered in pottery and it was yeah this old like pottery mine it was amazing it was an amazing yeah. space um uh, ian said that you're going i do you keep in touch you um, we're doing the michael and mary line next year with uh the mumming so yeah keep in touch and um come and join us for some of that that would be great yeah great i've just i don't know if you know phil smith but i've just uh i've just put a quote that's been that i i I love about walking in the chat. Um, it seems to resonate with some of the things that you've been talking about. So there you go. I would love to have a copy of the chat. Is it possible to get a copy? Like, do you do you copy it before? Yeah, brilliant. Actually, let yeah, me no, tell you right. how to get a copy yourself because I have a yeah. tendency to forget. I think about it and then yeah. I, I shut down the, the call and then I've forgotten. If you look at the chat, there's the three dots next to where you type the chat. If you press it, there is a download chat option. Ah, oh, brilliant. Fantastic. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah. Deepa, thank you. Excellent. Uh, in any case, um, um, the, let maybe Ian be the fish that leads us uh, <laughs> into the night. Um, yes, uh, looking as well to the beautiful sea uh, view uh, behind Carolas. Uh, <laughs> maybe it's time for uh, uh, to leave the school a fish and uh, go back home. Uh, could else, except if somebody would like to add something uh, as a last word. Um, but if not, thank uh, you very much. Uh, I would yeah, like to thank you. I just you want to say thank you for yeah. this uh, amazing conversation, uh, all of you. And um, uh, till the next Coop Cafe, which will be with uh, Carola uh, on, oh. Uh, oh, in two weeks uh, and with Jess moderating. Uh, so, um, um, Thank you again and a good night. Yeah. Thank you ever so much. Thank you for Thank having you. me. It was a real pleasure. And yeah, I look Bye. forward to your chat, your, your conversation. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.